Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series. Our guest today is John Dominguez. Thank you all for coming. As you know, this is something that we do weekly, whether it be from a, computer, a community leader um, doing an interview, or sometimes we do different programs. But today we are especially excited to welcome John Dominguez. He is a Coral Fellow here at Coral Pittsburgh. He is from the 2021 season, and he was our Coral Fellow with the Pittsburgh Hispanic Chamber. So we'll be hearing more about that shortly, but first I wanna welcome John. Hey, John. Hey, good afternoon. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see your face again. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I want to jump right in. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you're from and what your Hispanic background is? Yeah, sure. So I'm originally from Arlington, Virginia, uh, just outside the Capitol Beltway across the river. Uh, we're known to have the Arlington National Cemetery and the Iwo Jima uh, just graduated from school uh, last last spring uh, and moved to Pittsburgh this year or last year and uh, been around here since the, uh, since around September August uh, and my family you know we were actually uh, uh, Spanish we've been we were kicked out of Spain uh, for being uh, Protestant in a very Catholic country uh, we uh, you know eventually came to the United States uh, after a short stint in the Philippines. Uh, where we fought in the uh, the Philippine Scouts in the Second World War, and then you know they got kind of tired of the Philippines, and so they said, "Let's try the United States." Uh, and so they went to Oregon originally, uh, and then my grandfather Felipe uh, found a, a wonderful woman. Uh, Fortunately, in Oregon they had miscegenation laws, so he wasn't allowed to marry uh, this white woman because uh, they said, "Look, Felipe, your last name ends in E Z." Uh, and so, uh, but California said, "Hey, we don't care." Uh, and so they moved to California, uh, and that's where my family, both of my mom's and dad's side of the family, uh, met uh, in the San Francisco at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and so that's kind of, and then they eventually moved to the DC area, and that's where I was born and where I was raised. Um, and uh, that's kind of where I was, and now I'm up here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> John, that is a really fascinating family history. It's easy to see why, you know, being Latino and diversity really fits into your life. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how diversity played a role in your life growing up as well as in your professional life? Yeah, so we, we I come from obviously a very mixed racial family. Uh, on my mom's side, uh, we, you know, we're from Syria and Finland. Uh, and the, on my dad's side, obviously, that, that, uh, French and then Spanish uh, ancestry there. Um, and, you know, growing up in a very mixed racial household. And then obviously my dad's side of the family was very blue collar, whereas my mom's side was very white collar. Uh, again, my dad's side was uh, much more heavily Christian. My mom was more agnostic. Uh, so, you know, just growing up, I was very acutely aware of just being different um, and coming in a household that was had a lot of its own internal divisions. Uh, I think for me, growing up, I learned uh, diversity is really just about how you treat other people, uh, treating people with you know respect and dignity, being able to respond to differences uh, well, being compatible with those differences, um, and how to cope with those differences. As you can expect, uh, you know, having a Middle Eastern uh, side of the family with the Finnish household, you know, punctuality obviously was a source of friction. Uh, so. I inherited the uh, the values for punctuality. Uh, that, you know, for me, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, building up that tension right there. Like it's about not necessarily downplaying how you're different, but upplaying your commonalities, upplaying uh, your shared identity. So as a family, we very much united on raising my brothers and I. You know, my older brother had, was on the spectrum, high functioning you know, Asperger's. Uh, and then there was me and then my little brother, uh, so despite our family's differences uh, and those uh, conflicts, uh, we reunited as a family uh, and very much emphasized that shared identity as the house of Dominguez, if you will. John, I love that. I'm even learning so much about you already after all the time we've spent together. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, your, your history just has so many different 
different components that make you who you are. Um, and I know part of that, speaking of diversity and your cultural background, was how your mom was really a proponent for diversity in the home. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So yeah, in our family, we had a its own reading curricula. So in addition to school, uh, we had to read quite a few books, uh, you know, especially on Middle Eastern history. Very much world affairs was a big part of my upbringing. Uh, you know, that was something that was not something overlooked. Like, you know, no, hey, like the first thing you read is the world affairs. Uh, looking at, you know, the place of the United States, where we stand in the world today, uh, what is going on in the world. You know, being from such a, you know, where I have family in Syria still, uh, they live in Tartus. Uh, my cousin just got married last uh, last or two summers ago, uh, and he just actually had a baby on New Year's Day, uh, so January first. Uh, we had little little uh, little C, uh, what was his name? Little Hysom, uh to our family. So a lot of family there. Uh, so we're very excited about that. So it's just being a very. We've always. My mom was very big proponent on, you know, being uh, cognizant and you know investing time to understand where we are in the world. Um, and you know, she spent a lot of. Uh, you know, time and resources getting us to travel, you know, expose us to different countries uh, and, you know, having us read books. Um, you can always tell a lot about someone by their library. <laughs> that is so you, that statement. Um, John is a really big reader. I know, um, you know, I didn't tell you this question ahead of time, but John, what's your favorite book? Oh, man. Um, I think it's actually, I'm doing a reread right now, and that would be a uh, I actually have. I actually didn't know that this question was going to come up, but I am. I think democracy in America is, uh, you know, a treasury of insight on how the American democracy works. Uh, this man is probably the best sociologist, and probably ever uh, of all time. Uh, you just the way he is, just like page, and he's very concise with his writing. He doesn't take him thirty pages to make one point. He makes his point like within one page. So again, you know, we very value, much value concise writing uh, and just an infinite source and a fountain of wisdom for all Americans. I really think Democracy in America should be required reading uh, and everybody, I would encourage everyone to read that book. It's just absolutely spectacular book. Oh, thank you, John. That's amazing. Um, really quick, we're having a little bit of a microphone issue. If you just want to turn your volume down on your computer a little bit, it's kind of whistling. Um, that just might make it a little easier. I did mine too, just in case it was me. Um, but yeah, John is an avid reader. Um, and I do think that that comes from the home. Um, and we've had a lot of conversation conversations about why education is so important for the next generation. But where does that come from? And that kind of comes to the question of what are your parents' background professionally? Uh, yeah, so I'll start with my dad. Uh, my dad grew up uh, pretty poor high school, was good academically, but uh, you know, just wasn't a school that prepared you for higher education. So my dad actually started at community college, San Mateo Community College, got prepared, did really well, and then transferred to the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he met my mom. Uh, my mom actually, you know, eventually go there after a year in uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, and my dad uh, would end up going to law school at UC Hastings. Uh, he actually, ironically, when he was interning uh, as, a, as an attorney, as a law student, he uh, worked with Kamala Harris, who's the vice president of the United States right now. Uh, and at the time, she was like a year or two out of law school. And yeah, he didn't really cl work closely with her, but I do think that's kind of nice, nice bit, bit of family history that my dad kind of knew her before she became vice president. Uh, but yeah, my dad, you know, would do all kinds of things in the law, started off as a criminal prosecutor, would end up uh, working uh, in the World Trade Center. We used to live in New Jersey for a little while. Um, worked at the World Trade Center, worked at the South Tower. He was actually there at 9-11. Uh, so 9-11 is very, you know, a very personal event in our family history. Uh, he, he was there, that was his dream job, was to work at the, the South Tower, at the Twin Towers. Uh, he saw the first plane uh, hit the building, uh, so it's very, you know, obviously a very emotional event in our in our family. Uh, so he would end up doing what he was doing: white collar, New York stock, New York stock exchange, trial counsel. I still remember being in his office. I still remember take your son to work day, uh, and I still remember you could see the curve of the earth at the top floor of the, the, that building. Uh, and I still remember the, the magic show uh, for take your take your kid to work day. Uh, they always had like a magician there. Uh, so I still have very faint memories, 
even though I think I was only like four years old. Um, but uh, it was such a you know a spectacular moment. In my dad's life was working there, and then obviously having to watch the building collapse. Uh, but after that, he got tired of New York City, and so he now he, he's been working at the Securities Exchange Commission, which I always tell people police force on Wall Street. Uh, they very much police Wall Street, and he's been working there doing enforcement, and now he does equal employment opportunities. Uh, senior counsel there. So he's been an attorney all his life doing various things. And then my mom, my mom was a teacher for a long time. Uh, she was uh, a star off in LA. Uh, she taught in Compton, California, uh, when my parents were like newlyweds. And so they were there during the Rod Rodney King uh, conflict. Uh, my mom taught at a charity school. Uh, my mom was very adamant about, you know, I'm not going to teach at a you know private school she said, like, you know, I really want to teach, you know, on the ground children who really need that growth, who really need someone uh, to, you know, put in the ropes. And, you know, uh, she said that's kind of where a lot of my mom's values for reading and education come from is from her teaching days. And I would end up following her steps one summer uh, teaching in San Francisco for a summer through the Breakthrough Collaborative Program. Um, but uh, she said she was a teacher. And then uh, when she had us, then she started to, you know, sort of raise us full time. Uh, and that's a full time job. Uh, and that's kind of where, where we ended up let, leaving off. So uh, even when she died, actually, uh, she passed away in 2019. Uh, and we had students from all those years ago uh, reach out to us uh, and, you know, really show like, hey, look, like your mom, Gabriella, really changed my life, really made me see myself and apply myself in a way that I did not see myself before. Um, there was, you know, more than one story so very touching uh, it meant, meant a lot for me at the time john if you don't mind first of all i'm so sorry for the loss of your mom i as you know know how difficult that can be but for you that came at a really pivotal time i know you were in school you were doing a lot of different things um can you tell us about what that experience was like and what got you through it yeah sure i was a junior in college i was spring semester at the time um and ironically uh she we she redid her, her estate her will shortly before i went to college at the time i didn't think too much of it i thought this was going to be a job in 20 years um uh, so she died of stage four cancer very sudden very quick 40 days uh, and, uh, you know, at the time I was running for student body president at Cornell University uh, and, you know, we had a you know, campaign against I Israel to divest. I was leading the counter effort. We would end up def uh, defeating that sort of uh, campaign at Cornell. And then, you know, so running running this university wide campaign for president, uh, doing this other counter initiative uh, and then obviously doing school. And then I, you know, this fell on my lap uh, very, you know. I think it was the first time in my life I, I, I had acne on my face all over. Uh, I, I've been blessed uh, to have pretty good skin um, throughout my life. I've never, I've had maybe a zit here or two or there, but like that semester, it was just all over my, my face. I was just stressed the whole day, the whole day, day in, day out. You know, I, you know, shaking hands in the day and, you know, trying to uh, balance the family's uh, finances and everything. Um, so, but, you know, we ended up getting through it. I I remember I almost took a leave of absence from school, but I really didn't want to quit. I really wanted to quit the campaign. But, you know, I, I think in my mom's memory, I didn't want her to like really be seen as someone who quit. My mom didn't raise a quitter. Um, and so I stuck it out. I went through the campaign, even though some people told me, hey, John, like you can quit. Like nobody, you know, you don't have to explain yourself. But I, I did it for me and I did it for my mom. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, that following summer, I, you know, sort of made a memorial to my mother by uh, teaching uh, in San Francisco because that was what she did. That's what drew her passion. Uh, so it was a way through uh, teaching. That was a way for me to sort of serve, uh, you know, grieve for my mom, uh, be mem the memorial to my mom was that experience. Uh, and it was a pleasure, you know, sort of filling in my mom's shoes in the classroom. Uh, and, you know, for me, I think it was a, such a pivotal moment in my life because I, that was really when I really re reconnected my faith in Christianity. I think when you're in one of those situations, uh, where there's not really any few, any real answers, right. You know, how does, how does this happen? Uh, and I think that's really when I picked up, uh, the book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, 
which I highly encourage everybody to read. Uh, that was, I really, it was really at that time is when I started taking my faith with Christianity seriously. Uh, so that year I, you know, I, the, the, the following, uh, when I came back for senior year, I took a, a biblical literature class. I had went to, I went on this student mission trip to Israel, uh, where I actually, I got my cross there at the, uh, uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is where they, you know, where it said that uh, Christ was crucified, and I was able to, you know, get my cross on the uh, on the rock. Uh, and you know, I said my little prayer to, uh, to Christ, and on the anointed rock, which is where they said, you know, he was uh, lying, uh, where where they carried his body. Um, so it's a very special moment. I think my trip to Israel was another big monument to my mom because I. I got to really get as close to God as I can. Um, it was such a surreal experience to be right at the rock, uh, the, the Holy Sepulcher, you know, right at the site of the crucifixion. Um, I, I had no words, really. It was uh, I can't really describe it in words, the feeling, but I, I felt, I genuinely felt God's presence. Uh, it was a very important moment in my life. Um, and so for me, you know, while I can't really still explain my mother's passing, uh, you know, we, uh, we know she's doing well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it came was a sense of invincibility too. I think it was actually a source of confidence because I did all this. I didn't quit the campaign. I didn't win, but I went up it, by losing. I was able to actually go abroad to Argentina, which was another fantastic opportunity for me. Um, I, all these college students always go to Europe, which I don't understand why, because Europe's so expensive. I was in Argentina, very affordable on a college student's budget. Um, so by the end of the semester, I finished with the best GPA I had ever in college. So I finished with a fantastic GPA, uh, did great, great work academically. I finished the student body president campaign. You know, we won, uh, we beat the BDS campaign and, you know, I balanced the family's budget. I balanced, uh, you know, I executed my mother's estate. So by the end of it, I felt almost like a source of invincibility. Like I can do anything. If I can get through this, I can get through anything. Nothing is going to be too hard for John Dominguez. Uh, and so I think I got through it and uh, it really has been a source of confidence. Uh, Cause if you get through that kind of moment in your life, you know, nothing can be, nothing can beat that. Uh, so, you know, you can do anything. Uh, so for me, it was, it's a tragedy, but it's almost like, it's kind of like a Phoenix. Uh, and I'll just end with this, you know, for me, my, my, my Harry, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Uh, and so my Patronus, I say, is the Phoenix. Uh, and that's what my mom and I used to always say, uh, especially my mom suffered from very severe depression and mental health issues. And so we always, you know, her and I, we always emphasize the Phoenix is our Patronus, spirit animal. And, uh, you know, and the Phoenix, what makes the Phoenix the Phoenix is that they rise from the ashes all the time. That's how they, they re it's a, re a rebirth. Uh, and so for me, I very much uh, have, have championed, uh, you know, the idea of resurrection, rebirth, renaissance, you know, you can get through anything, just rise from the ashes, you know, from, uh, at the end of the day, you know, you can't be the underdog if you went, if you, if you went every time. So, you know, Oh, John, I had to put you on your own little screen like for a little bit. because You had me tearing up over here. Um, <laughs> John, I have to say, you know, that really reflects exactly how I think of you. Um, when you said, John, you can do anything. Um, I was going to say this a little bit later, but working with John has just been tremendous, you guys. I mean, I believe exactly what John said, that he can do absolutely anything he puts his mind to. And he can't just do it, but he can exceed the expectations and improve it and make it better. Um, and I hope that anything that I'm ever working on that John is a part of, because he's tremendous guys. Don't forget this face because he's, he's going places. <laughs> um, John, I, I want to say, you know, it's so beautiful hearing, you know, your backstory and your life story and where these things come from in your family and how you pursued and built on all of those things. Um, I, from what I've seen, that's what you do professionally. You know, you always, um, do a lot of research, reading. Um, it's just, it's really fascinating to see how your brain works and how you just want to do everything to the fullest. So just congrats on being an awesome person. I'm so glad we got connected through Coro. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So I want to know a little bit where some of those things come from. Um, when we were talking about things that influence you um, in leadership and life and professionalism, um, one of the things that we talked about was technology and it was actually a video game, which is pretty fascinating. Fascinating. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I'll uh, you know, sort of out myself as a nerd here, uh, but I very much spent a lot of my childhood and upbringing uh, playing World of Warcraft, which is a massive multiplayer on online role-playing game, MMORPG. Uh, I started playing in third grade, so I was about nine or ten years old, and I would play it. I still kind of play it here and now. I don't really have too much time to play it anymore, but uh, you know, I'd say I, I, I learned a lot. I say World of Warcraft, in a way, it raised me. Uh, you know, when you're nine, 10 years old and you're playing with a bunch of, you know, 18 year olds to 30 year olds, uh, you tend to grow up pretty, qu pretty quickly. Uh, and so uh, I would say video games can be a source of leadership training, uh, though I would I would, uh, you know, say maybe the shooting games, not so much, but more the the games that, you know, where you actually have to work with the team uh, and, you know, cooperate uh, and uh, you know, capture objectives to do it to perform objectives. And so World of Warcraft, I, I learned, first off, hard skill was typing. I was the fastest typer in middle school, had the highest uh, gross words per minute. I think it was called Guam or something. Uh, and so I learned how to type really quickly because I was a pretty sociable guy in the, in the video game world. So I had to learn how to type pretty fast. So that was a hard skill I learned. Uh, but soft skills, I, I, you know, I learned how to communicate. Communication was key. You know, how to keep teammates uh, updated with what I'm doing. And, you know, say we're in like a dungeon uh, or we're in like a battleground. We're doing player versus player. You got you, you to gotta really coordinate with others and really work together. Uh, it's not just about you. It's about the team. It's about getting to an objective. So I learned a lot of communication. I'd say team management, too. Uh, you know, you have to coordinate with other people's schedules. So now in the world of remote, you know, you constantly have to coordinate uh, with people and manage people's uh, schedules. That's a big thing in World of Warcraft uh, when you have to get 25 people together at the same time on a Thursday night or something. Uh, and, you know, if you say you're big, most important player, how do you manage the crisis? Uh, so I was saying a crisis management, leadership development, communication, uh, it's all there. Um, you just have to be intentional about it too. Uh, but, uh, you know, certain implicit ways to develop those skills. Uh, and so for me, World of Warcraft, especially back then, I was really, I was really, I was a very obese kid. Uh, I did not look like I am today. Uh, very, I've come a long way. And so uh, for me, this is where I found a lot of my friends too. Uh, and it really built in me some, a level of confidence that I don't think I had before. Uh, you know, I didn't have that many friends. I had my neighborhood, my neighborhood friends, but I wasn't, I wasn't a popular kid back then. Uh, you know, uh, and so for me, you know, in elementary school, middle school, this was, you know, my outlet of making friends and, you know, I had friends from across the world. Uh, and, uh, so it was truly a, a fantastic way to, uh, you know, build in, uh, build a little adolescent confidence in me back then. John, that is really fascinating. You know, so many times we hear about kids playing too many video games and the negative effects, but I agree with you so much that there are positive effects and it's really interesting that you use that as a tool. Um, do you think that technology overall will have a positive impact on children and future leaders of our country? I So I think nothing is ever inherently bad. I think though, Obviously, moderation is a cardinal virtue, uh, and so, and I think I am concerned about technology almost trying to substitute for human interaction. I think uh, the thing is, we just have to be, you know, and here at Coro, uh, we talk about, you know, intentionality. You know, be, you know, and I know in, in some churches they have this concept of sliding versus deciding. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that we're not sliding into technology, but you know, we're deciding. We're deciding or being intentional about how we use technology. I think intentionality and being very mindful uh, and aware of how we're using technology will be the big difference maker in it, whether or not this is going to be a productive use of our time and resources. Uh, but I think it, it's an excellent way uh, to integrate learning. Um, 
I think uh, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. That's always an exciting thing to be a part of. Um, but I do, I do, I, I think one thing that I think we also got to be careful of is, is be not too reliant on technology. Uh, and then here in Pennsylvania, right, we need uh, more broadband for rural communities that may not have access. Um, there's a lot of uh, access issues going on, and we have to make sure uh, we can maintain that and uh, invest in that. Uh, and how do we make that kind of dynamic environment? Um, but there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of future there. Um, you know, I'm working right now at Cora with my innovation placement uh, with Digital Dream Labs, which has a robot uh, that kind of teaches kids how to code called Cosmo. So that's like a cool way to use integrating technology uh, for learning. Um, so I think, yeah, with, with it in technology, I think we just have to have that, you know, cognizant uh, impact of like uh, intentionality with the key again, sliding versus deciding. Are we just sliding towards technology or are we deciding to use technology? Um, so that's, uh, that's been a big, I think that's probably a big part of the, the solution. I love that deciding and not sliding, being intentional with things that that is a great way of looking at it, John. Well, in a lot of the things that you've talked about, um, you've talked about, you know, how communicating with others and interactions are really important. Um, and based on our conversations, I know that teamwork um especially growing up was really important to you you were very active in high school we would love to hear a little bit about that for students who might be you know at that age now and the importance of that activity and teamwork in professional life yeah so i think uh especially when you're a young person it's now is the opportunity to do things uh and really get involved because you know honestly the bar is kind of low uh, and so you don't, have, you know, it's very, and people want young people. It, it energizes people. Honestly, when you see young people doing things, uh, it's in inspirational. It gets people motivated because they're like, oh, this young gun's doing it. Well, I, I, I got to work harder. I got to do better. I, you know, I, there, you know, it gets, it has a, it has a nice, and people root for young people. Um, so, you know, I remember, you know, when I, out of high school, we, a couple of my colleagues and I, we founded this nonprofit called Youth Caucus of America. Um, and uh, it was essentially, we tried to brand it as the AARP for youth, uh, really trying to be that youth advocacy uh, on Capitol Hill in policymaking. Uh, and, you know, you think uh, you'd see an 18 year old uh, leading a, a meeting on with congressional staff, uh, with a member of Congress inside the Capitol. Uh, you know, it might be a little bit intimidating uh, or like, oh, they're not going to listen to you, John. But, People got energized. They, they love seeing that because uh, they're used to seeing seventy-year-old lobbyists. Uh, you know, so for them, they see all oh, this really, you know, energetic eighteen, nineteen-year-old John Dominguez, uh, and you know, people people value that, and people made time for me because uh, people value young people. I think one thing that people don't understand is that you know, at, at a young age, right, people do value uh you know ushering in the next generation of leadership uh, and so it's very much people see it as oh this is an investment in young people so you know and there's so many things you can do i remember you know bringing in high school we a couple a kid and i we started the first virginia high school leadership academy the first of its kind uh, and so we got you know operatives and people in various industries to come together uh, and train some uh, high school talent in Virginia. We had, uh, I think it was like 30 people. Uh, so that was the first one. It's still going on. That was in 2015. So it's five, six years still going on. Uh, and then I remember I went to the Hispanic Bar Foundation, Hispanic National Bar Foundation's uh, Future Latino Leaders Law Camp. It's now the Summer Law Institute. Uh, and I saw you know, a lot of other programs I participated in as I have an alumni network. Uh, and so I, you know, we were bringing in 30 very talented Hispanic leaders from across the country to D.C. in this free 10 day trip to D.C. Uh, and you're meeting all these great you know, lawyers uh, in, in, in private practice and in, in, uh, all kinds of fields. And, you know, they were not doing anything afterwards. It was like you would go and then you'd leave. And so I found a way. It's like, why don't we create this alumni account so to keep people engaged with the organization? Uh, and so we started an alumni council uh, where I'm still serving as the president of 
and we just had our, our, our first sort of law school Q and A panel the other week. Uh, and then we had a holiday party uh, over, over Christmas. Um, so we're you're getting quality, quality engagement with alumni who, you know, still have that desire to really give back and, uh, you know, support the organization that gave so much to us. Uh, so that was just something I, I did in high school. And I still do today. Uh, there's just a lot of ton of value going on. You know, I think my senior year, I got a scholarship from the Hispanic Heritage uh, Foundation. They have the youth awards. Uh, and so I got the silver medal for community service. Uh, that's another great organization to be a part of. They give out scholarships. Uh, so there's a lot to do for young people. You just gotta be willing to hit Google, uh, you know, and reach out to people. Uh, they'll, they want to help, people want to help people in this world. I know sometimes people, there's a lot of sad news all the time. The media is always, you know, giving us tragic news, but, uh, you know, there are good people and they are people who will make time for you. If you just have to ask, you just have to ask. <laughs> John, you are just a wealth of experiences and knowledge. You are well beyond your years. Every time I talk to you, um, you know, I kind of, I forget with all the experience that you have, you seem like you've lived several lives already. I can't wait to see what's next. Um, speaking of what's next, I know you're really interested in politics. We talked a little bit about your lobbying and your nonprofit. Tell us where your love of politics comes from and what your goals are for that. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's been interesting. It's been a ride, a roller coaster. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think some of my earliest memories uh, were when I was in elementary school. My family uh, was very proponent of Barack Obama, then senator. He was running for the Democratic nomination at the time, and a lot of kids in my school were very Hillary Clinton types. Um, and you know, being a little kid in my, as such as I, I was pretty ignorant too. I don't really know. My mom just told me who to vote for. I wasn't voting, but. Uh, you know, I very much been a, was a champion for Barack Obama at the time. I remember going into uh, third, fourth grade. We I come into school early and write, you know, Obama 08 on the whiteboards. Uh, so I was very much, you know, I felt like I was really part of the campaign. Uh, you know, I was energetically went after, you know, the pro Hillary uh, crowd in my school and was very much, you know, I'm a very confrontational in politics. You know, like let's seek out the opposition. I've always something I've always valued is opposing viewpoints. Uh, I think debate uh, is actually has a bad rap, but I think debate's also a good tool. Again, being intentional with how you use debate. If you're using debate to just kind of own people, to dunk on them, you're probably not going to have a very productive discourse. And I think that's kind of reflective of what we are today. Uh, but I, I, I find it's a very useful tool when I use it to sort of understand uh, the opposition. Uh, my, people who might have different viewpoints because they might even have something that I haven't considered yet. Uh, I use debate as almost like an experiential learning in that I kind of test out different arguments. I might not even believe it, but I want to see how people respond to those arguments. Uh, and so it's been a way for me to like learn, you know, what are my blind spots, uh, how different arguments work out. I think debate for me in politics has been a way for me to really express my, uh, my moral values and also you know, learning as I go. I've learned, I've met quite brilliant people in politics. Um, and I, I've learned quite a bit on just like who I am, uh, where I, again, where I am in the world uh, today. Um, and again, you know, this goes back to diversity. You know, how do you treat people who are different? How do you treat people who think differently than you? Um, you know, how do you respond to those differences? Um, and I think that's something that's a lot of times missing in the conversation. It's just, let's just go back to the basics, you know, let's just start treating people better. Um, you know, people who are different, people with different political opinions than you, people who have different values, how do you treat those people? Um, and so that was always been something that I valued. Uh, I, I seek out, I'm a weird kid. I seek out people who disagree with me. Uh, I have on my bookmark, on my folder, uh, just called left, right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I check out, you know, what everybody's saying. I think it's important to know uh, before we, yeah, I think people have an interesting uh, thought. I'll just end with this. You know, we tend to value having an opinion over knowing what we're talking about. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes it's really good to just kind of step back 
and sort of just like listen in and just take it in before we start uh, professing our opinions. Uh, but again, if you want to profess your opinion, that's fine, right? And I think that's a great way to explore, you know, where you stand in the world, where you see the issues and how they inter intersect and respond at the same time, right? How do you, how are you, how are you managing that relationship with other people? How, how do you, you know, are you, are you making it, making people feel safe to you know, sort of express themselves? Um, and so that's been a big, uh, big part of my life. And I love that about you. I think that, um, you know, you definitely had it before that time, but with you being in debate club younger, I think that it really developed that. And even in our conversations, you know, we're very similar. Um, but we definitely don't always agree. And that's one thing that I love about conversations with you is you're always respectful. You're always, you know, looking to learn new information. And you also do research and bring the facts. <laughs> I have conversations with John, you guys, where like we've been talking about something and the next day he'll come and he'll have so much more because it didn't just end there for John, you know, he wants to keep learning. And I think that that is just such an amazing quality in someone. Um, John, what would you say to, you know, students who are coming up now who we would like to see those qualities and what tips do you have for them to develop that, you know, love of learning and respect for debate? Yeah, I think my uh, advice, attitude, number one attitude, you know, I think you know, the attitude shapes and honestly, negativity loves company, company, uh, negativity spreads. It's a, it's really, it's, it's like its own form of coronavirus, a very contagious attitude. Uh, whereas optimism too, also kind of contagious. Uh, and I think, you know, having an attitude really starts, um, it really shapes how you view the world. Uh, and I think, Number two, responsibility, taking responsibility for your opinion, right? Sometimes you're wrong. I have, I've been in certain debates where I've gotten my butt kicked like very badly. Um, that's just goes, but you know what? Like it was a way to learn in those conversations. I don't really, I don't really learn when I like six, I think like have dismantled uh, someone's argument. Okay. Like I just confirm my belief, but you don't really grow. Uh, it's really when I walk away really battered uh, is when I, you know, I find, wow, you know, that argument really didn't really work so out so well. Uh, you know, I, I'll walk away from it, you know, a, a very big conversation, even if it was a public one where I'm like in front of people and I, you know, John just got spanked. Uh, but those are the way and you walk away and you're like, dang, that didn't work. But, uh, you know, but my attitude was, well, you know, I, I got, clearly I got to do more research on this. Clearly, like, this is an opportunity for me to sort of grow, um, you know, so instead of seeing it as like a, a zero sum game of win lose and more see it as an opportunity to really enhance and strengthen your understanding of the world. Uh, that's like, again, that's where attitude comes in and, you know, taking responsibility for yourself on that end. Um, and Number three, I, and I'm final, I'll, I'll end with this, but really just seeing life as one of self-improvement. Uh, I think seeing your life every day as, um, you know, finding your purpose in life as one of becoming somebody. I think something we, we sort of get to in this fast paced environment and in a very career uh, focused uh, community, it's very easy to get caught up in trying to, trying to get somewhere. It's all about destination. Uh, and I think sometimes we get lost in like, how do we become somebody? How do we become someone that we want to like? Um, how do we become a good person? And I think this comes back to uh, my Christian values, where you know Christianity differed from uh, you know other religions at the time. Instead of you know the Romans and the Greeks, you know having these gods part of your lives, in Christianity it was about having God and you become somebody. Um, and I think that is something, you know, again, where you, where, how do you find, how do you become someone? And one way of doing that is really, how do I make myself a better person every day? And one of that is really just self-improvement. You know, what can you do every day to make yourself 1% better at something? Because just like compound interest rates that we all, you know, learn in personal finance, you know, one, if you get better 1% every day, that adds up over a long period of time. Um, so that'd be my final thing is really just see everything as an opportunity for growth, as an opportunity for improvement. 
see yourself as improving yourself every day as your sort of life ethic. Keep growing every day. You guys heard it from John and he lives that every day. Um, you know, of course, I think, and I know that you believe as well, that that is the number one part of the journey, that no matter what is happening, you are learning from it. But let's talk a little bit more about the technical side. Um, we have a lot of people who tune in that are students who see you and are just probably shocked by all of these experiences you have, wondering what you went to school for, where you went. Tell us a little bit about that technical background. Sure, I, so I, you know, after high school, I started my freshman year at Boston College, which was a Jesuit Catholic institution. Had a blast there, met some really cool people I'm still in touch with. I would transfer over to Cornell University uh, where I studied industrial and labor relations. Uh, so the way I break that down to people is essentially the study of the workforce, workforce, de workforce development. Um, and so it was kind of like, you know, you're studying labor history, labor law, labor relations, uh, capital markets. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very cr interesting coursework. It sounds very dry, uh, but, you know, and they, the ILR school is at Cornell, the Indus School of Industrial and Labor Relations, ILR, they very much seek motivated people, uh, people like me uh, who, you know, outgoing, uh, you know, we always said, you know, at the, at, on campus, ILR was this, uh, you know, covered like half of campus leader, leadership positions on campus, despite it being the second smallest school in the university. Uh, so you see that admission, their admissions, uh, admi admissions culture sort of seep into the campus and you see it is a really a living reflection of the school's values. Um, so. I did that out in school. In school, I was, uh, you know, on the student government uh, as the ILA representative, um, and did some really spectacular things. Cornell is one of those schools where the student government's taken pretty seriously, uh, and so I was able to get in great conversation with administrators. I, you know, we centralized the printing system to make it free. It was actually rather pretty expensive uh, when I first came to Cornell, and uh, you know, once again, you know, we can complain about the problem or be part of the solution. And so I, you know, joined the task force on printing reform. And after two years of negotiations, we centralized printing, which very much lowered costs of printing. And uh, we were able to bring free printing to students after two years. So that, that's a really cool legacy to have. Um, and sort of other technicals, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, but I very much explored different careers too. I had a short stint in human resources, uh, was originally pre-law, um, and um, I've tried other businesses um, and obviously politics. So I also surveyed a lot of uh, different industries when I was in school too. Um, so I think that, that covers a lot of the technicals in my education background. I did also a summer at community college. A uh, community college, I did took philosophy excellent you know student body there what i like about community college is you get a very diverse student body and that there are people like me who are in college there are people who are there as a stepping stone for college there are people there who are just there for just for the sake of learning uh there are people who are like in their 60s who are like you know they're empty nesters and they're like i just want something to do like this is a cool way for me to grow uh and so I love the community college student body and you have people there working two jobs and doing this. Those guys are superstars. Um, so I, I, I love community college, big proponent of community college. Um, so I've been four year school transfer community college. Uh, I've, I've, I've been everywhere. <laughs> he has done it all. Um, and I want to, I, I want to get, the next question really quick. I just want to ask you about how you feel that that diversity of experiences goes into making you who you are so that we can lead into talking about the Coral program. Of course. So um, I would first say again, another book recommendation here, uh, View from the Top by Dr. Mark Michael Lindsay. Uh, he's the president of Gordon College. He was actually the youngest president of a university. I think he's only like 32 or 31 when he took the job. Uh, he's also, uh, I think he was, uh, he went to Princeton, uh, theological seminary. Great guy. I was actually able to get on the phone with him, uh, as a, as a reader, I reached out and, uh, I cold, cold emailed and, uh, he picked up, uh, so that was really cool to kind of talk to the author, but his book though, view from the top, he surveys 500 CEOs, 
senior government leaders, uh, you know, very top people from like Jimmy Carter to Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan Chase. Um, and so one thing he talks about is all of these people have very diverse experience, sets of experience. They have exposure to different industries and different job descriptions. Uh, and that's seriously in a, in a, in a, in a fast paced environment, work and place environment that we live in today, you know, being able to be adaptable and immerse yourself in a new field uh, and having exposure to that. Uh, being, you don't necessarily have to be a specialization, but you just have to be proficient. You don't need native fluency, but you need to be proficient. You know, you don't need to be able to read, you know, say, take this in a language context, you know, you don't need to be able to read crime and punishment in Russian, but can you talk to someone in Russian? Uh, essentially, like, you just need to be proficient. And, you know, that is the, the capital advantage uh, that people have. Uh, and so that that is very much, you know, sort of captures why I value just, you know, having my foot in different places, uh, being able to, you know, pivot from each sector of our environment uh, and be able to really just kind of be placed anywhere and succeed. Uh, and that's a, a critical skill in our society. And that is something that I see you do every day, John. And that's why I think you fit so well into the Coro program. So I think that some people who are watching might not know about Coro. So why don't you give us a brief introduction and tell us what the program is and what the benefits are? Sure. So Coro is a nine month fellowship here in Pittsburgh. Uh, has a great reputation in this city. It's about oh, a little over 20 years old in Pittsburgh. Uh, it originally was founded in the 1940s, just after the Second World War started in San Francisco, uh, as a way to, you know, how do we get people, you know, prepared for public affairs leadership? Uh, and so it has a great alumni, some really cool people have been a part of it. Diane Feinstein, Michael Bennett, uh, Tim Kaine. Uh, these are three U.S. senators who are alums of the program. A lot of ambassadors, um, a lot of just really impressive people. Uh, have been a uh, part of the program. And then, you know, we're lucky here in Pittsburgh to have uh, the program here. Essentially, what makes the program the program, what makes Coro Coro is, you know, we work in government, business, nonprofit, and innovation, and then a one of your choice. Uh, so you spend, you're kind of a consultant in these different industries, and you, you do these rotating cycle pl placements. Uh, so you get exposure to five jobs in nine months. Now, normally, if you have five jobs in nine months, that looks pretty poorly on your job application. So Coro is this unique program where having five jobs in nine months is a good thing. Um, and it gives you that cross-sector exposure that puts you at, again, such an incredible advantage in the, in, in the, in the employment market, right? Because you can, you know, you're agile. You've proven yourself that you can work in different industries. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that is a value and being able to, you know, sort of navigate each sector uh, and kind of break it down. That's a huge part of Coro. Uh, and so, it, you know, you have, a, you have a lot of support on the staff. Uh, a lot of people in the city know about Coro. Uh, you know, they see Coro and they go, wow, you know, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down with you. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity to really get to know Pittsburgh. If you want to get to know Pittsburgh too, I mean, and Pittsburgh is a, what, what makes Pittsburgh, Coral Pittsburgh, I think cooler than the other placements in New York City, LA, and San Francisco. Now they're actually just starting one in St. Louis. Uh, but Pittsburgh is a is a city that I would say big enough to you know have that size, but small enough that you know after Coro you can feel very familiar with the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, that you really can break down the city of Pittsburgh, identify how the processes and institutions work, how they all interact with each other, how the nonprofits work with the businesses and all the whole circle in the nine yards. Um, so it's truly a, a fantastic opportunity for anybody, and especially if you're out of college or say you want a career pivot. Say maybe you're 26, 27 years old, you know, and you're not really satisfied with where you're at. and You kind of want to do a pivot. Coro, again, that's another popular move. What, what brings people to Coro is to do a career pivot. And people come out of Coro with uh, job offers or they go to grad school afterwards. Uh, it's really what you make of it. So it's a tremendous opportunity for anybody. I think you're on mute.
Melanie, I think you're on mute. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it happens to all of us in this That's in this uh, Zoom age, right? Um, <laughs> but I was I was actually going on and on about um, how Coro has, you know, you mentioned the five jobs, but there are five specific regions that Coro focuses in. Um, tell us a little bit about how it works with what those areas are, how you get connected with the jobs, um, and then how how you follow up with those afterwards. So, uh, yeah, so essentially you'll have the government placement, business placement, nonprofit, innovation. Uh, and so you can have some input on where you get placed. Uh, the team, Coro basically places you, uh, you know, different companies will come to Coro and be like, we need this project done. Um, and Coro, we would love to have one of your staffers to basically again, be a consultant, get the project done. Um, and, uh, you know, you have some input on sort of like, you know, what kind of industry, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of work you're looking at, and then they'll place you. Uh, and you kind of, you know, your job is to get the job done. Uh, and really, again, it's also up to you. Again, this is kind of where like Coro, you have to be very much a self-starter. You know, you have to make your placement like you have your job, but then there's different ways you can leverage that opportunity. Every placement is an opportunity. Uh, and uh, you have to, again, this goes back to attitude as a mindset. You know, how can I leverage this placement to get as much experience as I want? And a lot of this has to do with, again, you know, being a self-starter, you know, take an initiative, you know, take on certain tasks that they haven't yet assigned you. Uh, but maybe you anticipate that job and be like, hey, I'm actually, you know, uh, for example, I I've been working with, I was working with Steve Irwin uh, on his political jungle TV show. I realized that social media was kind of faint. And I said, Hey, you know, Steve, like I'll take on that job right now. You know, I know we're just doing interviews, but I'll take on social media. I've never done a social media managing gig, but I'll do it. Uh, so I was a way of, again, like adding more on my plate. And I think that's, uh, you know, something that those are the, where success comes at core. I was like, how do you add stuff to your plate? How do you take on responsibility and how do you advocate for yourself? These were again, all, critical skills in the workplace. Uh, this is what makes Cora such an effective program. Um, and then, yeah, some, some organizations, they have this permanent gap that they want to fill. And so that's where a lot of job opportunities will come in and be like, hey, you did this six week cycle with us. It was kind of a way for us to experiment if we like you or not, uh, and you did really well. Uh, and we kind of have this gap that still needs to be filled. Hey, John, like, would you want to come on board with us after Cora? Uh, and that's, you know, some people literally, literally, quite literally design their own job description and their own job uh, at Coro, and they end up leaving, uh, and they end up doing some fantastic things. I know one Coro alum is joining at the mayor's office, and, uh, you know, they started the snow angel thing where um, volunteers, people can volunteer to snowplow people's driveways for elderly people who, you know, maybe not, don't have the physical strength or stamina to snow plow their driveway and so yeah you know people again this is about civic engagement like hey i'll volunteer for my community and help out my neighbor uh on this portal uh, and people can go around and help uh you know their neighbors and community members uh you know make sure their 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 driveway is clean and uh not in violation of the law so that's a, that was a core love and again those things like that that kind of institute institutional thinking well, John, I don't know if everyone watching knows, but we got connected with John through the Coral Fellows program. Um, he did six, week, six weeks with us at the Hispanic Chamber, um, and he tackled a huge project that is going to make waves for years to come, which is something that I'm sure we'll be sharing. So I want to thank you for that work, John. Um, and within that, you know, we had a lot of discussions about why it's important to support the Hispanic community economically. Can you speak a little bit on the politics side and you as a Latino and an upcoming professional, um, why you think that's important and what it means to you? So, yeah, I mean, as we were to look at the data, right? I mean, uh, Hispanics are having a tremendous growth in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, Pittsburgh obviously has been having a declining population, but what's been kind of our lifeboat here uh, is the Hispanic population has been uh, populating our city. Uh, keeping uh, our labor market uh, vibrant and uh, dynamic, um, you know, it's uh, it's quite it's it's a, it's a phenomenal opportunity to really invest uh, to be on, in the work the, you know, the workforce of the future. Uh, you know, in Hispanics is a community that you know values work, dignity in work, future of work, 
Uh, we are a community that values hard work. With hard work, we'll, 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 get, we'll capture the American dream. That's what my family came to the United States for. Uh, and that, and we, 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 we got there, you know, my family left Syria, my family left Spain. We, you know, we found, we came here in the United States. Sure. There were some issues, right? We couldn't get married for a while in Oregon, but, uh, we, we, we found our way and that's truly, you know, for me, that is the American experiment, right? Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the Hispanic community has been here for a long, long time, has been there and helped build America, uh, and long for a long for centuries, we, you know, a lot of Hispanics are actually Native Americans, uh, and so, you know, we've been here. We have a huge stake in the uh, the community, uh, and uh, we're there's an, a very much passionate energy to celebrate the United States, what we stand for, American, you know, democratic and republican values. You know that we are, you know, what makes America the republic as so remarkable is it because it was the first republic there were republics before the united states but what made america amazing was uh that it was a republic that thrived and endured because republics fell very quickly they had very short lives before the united states the united states was the first republic that has withstood the tests of time uh and that is something that is remarkable that's something hispanics in america celebrate and we want to be a part of that uh, and businesses love that. And we, you know, we, we, we do hard work and, uh, you know, we bring a lot of, a lot of new jobs are because of Hispanics, Hispanics, you know, again, the data shows that we start up our own businesses. We're very self-starter starting community. We're not afraid to take that risk and sort of, you know, take things on our own, be our own boss, uh, you know, very entrepreneurial community and uh, willing to help each other. Very, a lot of mutual aid, self-help. And, uh, you know, we, they say like, you know, Hispanics were responsible for almost like a, you know, X amount of jobs opening in the United States, uh, because that's what we're doing. We're starting businesses, we're starting communities, uh, and that's, uh, you know, truly a very American thing. You're on mute again. <laughs> That's number two. We have Monica in the comments. She said, I could only make one mistake, so I, I broke the rules. <laughs> but um, that's so true. Um, and I, I got a little bit thrown off by that. But um, for those of you who don't know who are watching, Hispanics actually open businesses at a rate of three to one when compared to all other groups nationally. And Latinas alone are responsible for 50% of every job created. So it is absolutely essential to work with the Hispanic community and um, you know help us thrive economically so we can help the whole country thrive economically as well. Um, John, so you mentioned that you're new to Pittsburgh through the Coro program and you've had a good experience here. Tell us what your thoughts are on the city coming from somewhere else and if you're going to stay. Yeah, I think uh, what I love about this city is uh, it's, it has a, a unique blend of really just everybody. Where I'm from, it's kind of homogenous in the way in terms of like jobs. It's, you know, you're next to the, the federal capital. So a lot of people are in government. Uh, or you're a lawyer. Uh, and so Pittsburgh is like this vibrant labor sector. Uh, you have just a, an incredible diversity of different jobs, different interests. Uh, and there's a, you know, a, a remarkable opportunity here. And, you know, really being a part of the renaissance that's going on in this city uh, after the decline of the steel industry and then watching Pittsburgh really, you know, take itself, bring its Bring it, bring it together, and really, you know, revive itself. Uh, I think that you know, being a part of that, it's been a really cool opportunity to watch that and be a part of that. And so, I very much, I think, I, I believe that I'll be staying here and making myself home here in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, there's a lot of room for young talent uh, to fill gaps and you know, drive that impact and making, uh, you know, reviving the community uh, in a way that's you know, beneficial to everybody. You know, I think there's a, you know. We have the Pittsburgh edge here. You know, it's a very, you know, I would say cheaper rental market. So, you know, we can, you know, why go to San Francisco when you can come to Pittsburgh? Uh, and uh, we have that community there. Um, I think uh, there's just so much to do here that you can't do anywhere else. And I think 
what's nice about Pittsburgh, it's like this balance of, again, big enough to have size, but also small enough that everybody knows each other. You know, it's a community. People know each other here. Everybody's maybe one or two connections apart. Uh, and so, so for me, that, that means a lot to me. Uh, civic engagement, civil society uh, is, a, is an incredible value. Uh, and I think that's where Pittsburgh's, the Pittsburgh edge really embodies there. The Pittsburgh Edge. I love that. I'm, I'm going to hold on to that one for you. <laughs> um, so, John, we learned so much about you today. It was amazing hearing about your background and your choral program that you're going through right now. But tell us what's next for you and what else do we need to know? Yeah, I think uh, I'll probably be, uh, you know, hopefully if uh, funding comes through, we'll be uh, joining, uh, joining you at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Mel Melody. Uh, so looking forward to working with that uh, for our next steps here. Uh, in terms of what else, uh, I'm a big fantasy reader. I love the Stormlight Archive uh, by Brandon Sanderson. Um, so he's one of the biggest, you know, if you were looking for the next Harry Potter series, uh, I would look up Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. They're really big books, about a thousand pages. Don't let that intimidate you because they're like one of those books where like you pick it up and you can't put it down. Um, they're kind of a have their like their their own addictive quality to it, uh, and then lastly, just a piece of advice for the you know the young people in the audience, um, you know, take advantage of this to opportunity in your life to really get to know and reach out to people. Uh, again, life is like again has a pay it forward model where when you're young, people are willing to invest in you more and mentor you. Uh, when you get older, you'll find and observe that people are less willing to do that because they expect you to be mentoring and, you know, helping other people out. Um, so that's why you see in your 20s, when you're in your 20s, this is not a time to, you know, sort of uh, be, be, be uh, again, sliding versus deciding. Uh, be very intentional with what you're doing uh, and reach out. You know, go on LinkedIn uh, and go reach out. May, hey, say you know you like working with your hands. Like, you know, I want to be a welder. You know, let's go. Let's go talk to a trade school representative uh, who can tell me about that. Uh, let, go talk to someone in trade into a trade that you're interested in. Uh, say you're in, interested in marketing. Go look up a marketing person in Pittsburgh and go set up a conversation with them. People want to help you and they want to see you succeed. And you know. Everybody, people will, will, you know, you'd be surprised how many people will say, yes, I will meet with you and talk to you about my experiences so that you can get an idea of, uh, you know, what this industry will be like. Again, use this, your 20s, use your time to explore and don't hesitate to reach out to people uh, to explore. I myself, I have spoken to people in HR, to law, to business. I have uh, an interview tomorrow, I mean, not tomorrow, next week with someone in consulting another person in brand brand strategy. I'm open-minded to any career because I want to make sure what I pick is one that I want to do uh, long-term. And so, you know, people will say yes uh, and just, you know, take advantage of their knowledge. Be like, hey, like, I just wanted, like, I'm thinking about this. Can we talk about this? And, you know, people will say yes. So use the critical age, your critical age. You are at the critical age to really take advantage of that you know, mentorship uh, and knowledge from other people to get to know what, so, so again, if you don't know what you want to do, which kind of like in my boat, uh, go talk to people who, who do know uh, and, you know, kind of survey their knowledge. So that's my, my last piece of advice for uh, uh, the young, the young, uh, young adults here. <laughs> oh, John, well, everything that you've said has just been so enlightening, but before we go, I want to just recap a few things. Um, one of the things that you said, was don't complain about the problem be a part of the solution right um another one was grow one percent every day because then your growth will be exponential and the final takeaway that i want to say is that john has left a mark everywhere he has gone and a positive mark if you guys didn't hear the whole interview i do recommend that you go back once it's posted and listen in every experience john has had when there was a problem he didn't just say well that's a problem and let it go john found a solution he spearheaded a campaign 
whatever he needed to do to fill a gap and improve things. And it is truly an inspiration. And we are so blessed to be stealing you from Virginia and bringing you here to Pittsburgh, um, and especially to the chamber and the community. So John, thank you so much for all the work that you've done, not only for us, but throughout your life. It's It's been fascinating. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melanie. Well, thank you all for tuning in. So we are going to be doing this again next week. We will be putting up the event. We hope to see you guys there. Um, if you haven't watched before, the Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Its goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth, and foster opportunity. Speakers and workshops include community leaders and members, as well as, as other individuals and programs that have a positive impact on not only the Hispanic community, but the Pittsburgh region at large. If you guys want to find more information, learn more about the chamber, or become a speaker, please visit www.pmahcc.org. Be sure to check the comments to connect with John on LinkedIn. And if you're looking for information about Coro, visit coropittsburgh.org. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.